comedian Bill Hicks used to joke, a lot of Christians wear crosses around their necks. You think when Jesus comes back, he's going to want to see a cross? It's not an original point, Bill. Uh, the incongruity is obvious right from the first century. It is a method of extreme torture and humiliating execution. This cross has become the most prominent religious symbol in the world, but there's an intentionality behind that. Uh, there is this redemption of something that is bloody, that is violent, that is cruel, that has now become uh, a symbol of hope, of joy, and of peace. There has been a, a, an incredible redemption of this unspeakable horror. And that really is what Swords into Plowshares is all about. It's a, it's a phrase uh, taken from Isaiah, and it refers to the Bible's messianic hope that the Messiah, through his own act of redemption, will redeem even weapons of war, and they will, in his hands, become tools of fruitfulness and life. Swords will be turned into plowshares. Uh, let me read from Isaiah chapter 2, from verses 2 to 5. In the last days, the, mountains of the, the, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of, of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, so that we may walk in His paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Here is this saying, swords into plowshares, on the day when we will no longer train for war any more. Uh, in 1918, there was an old gospel song that was released based on verse 4 here, Ain't Gonna Study War No More. It's also known as Down By The Riverside. Perhaps you know the song? Gonna lay down my sword and shield, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. Gonna lay down my sword and shield, down by the riverside, ain't gonna study war no more. Other verses say, going to talk with the Prince of Peace, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. Final verse says, going to shake hands all around the world, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. And the chorus, I ain't going to study war no more. It's funny, I, I used to think that that song was all about graduating from GCSE history. You know, I ain't going to study war no more. Hooray. No, no, it's actually quoting from verse 4 here. They will no longer train for war anymore. There'll, there'll be no more military and there'll be no more need for military strategy. We won't train for war anymore. In this future hope proclaimed throughout the Bible, no one will train for battle because wars will cease to the ends of the earth, as Psalm 46 puts it. So that's what they sang in 1918, gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside. Can you imagine singing that in 1918, just as the armistice is being signed Ending World War I, going to lay down my sword and shield. Imagine a global armistice, a cosmic armistice, an eternal, unbreakable armistice. Imagine peace reigning, peace between nations, peace with the world, peace with our neighbors, peace in our hearts, peace with God. Imagine that. It's coming. The Word of God promises it. But it will take more than a treaty to achieve this future, won't it? I mean, you can cease all military hostilities, but what's going to bring peace to the human heart? How can we really make all wars cease? Well, these verses say that the house of the Lord will be lifted up, and then everything will be put right. Actually, we've already seen that happen. Christ is the true temple, the true house of the Lord, and He was destroyed and then raised up again on the third day, cross and resurrection. And He is the true meeting place with the living God. Now in risen power, His word goes out to all nations and the world flocks to find peace in Him. While we wait for His second coming, He has assured us that there will be wars and rumors of wars. That's Mark chapter, eight verse, uh, chapter, chapter 13, verse 7. But in the meantime, we see the principle of His redemption working its way out, working its way out, its way out. We can see many examples of swords being turned into plowshares. There's technology that has been designed for destruction, 
uh, being redeemed for productive purposes. But swords into plowshares is just a sign of what the cross achieves. The power, the pattern, and the prototype for all such redemption is the cross of Jesus. There, deicide is turned into the world's salvation. There, the sword of judgment fell upon Jesus, and yet he went into the ground to come up again more fruitful. A sword into a plowshare. No wonder Christians wear crosses around our necks. We know what we're doing. This is the sign, the the engine of all redemption. And while we wait for the Prince of Peace to bring his victory to the ends of the earth, we wait in hope and we sing the old hymn, crown him the Lord of Peace. His kingdom is at hand. From pole to pole let warfare cease and Christ rule every land. All hail Redeemer hail, for you have died for me. Your praise shall never, never fail throughout eternity. (music) 